We're here with the famous Matt Goss, uh, the new king of Las Vegas. Matt, how are you doing? I'm good, man. It's good to see you. Likewise. You look very pretty today. Yeah, you know, we're clashing a we're little clashing, bit. Well, but... I said, you know, we couldn't really clash more than we do right now. <laughs> it's okay. It's... So Matt, uh, obviously, you know, we can, we're going to go through just kind of your story overall and how you ended up here in Vegas, because most people, I think, you know, as you travel around the world, when you say you live in Vegas, they, you know, they, yeah, they think, think of it as one thing. And yeah, they think yeah. we're walking around with poker chips in our pockets <laughs> and playing cards and we're like, you know. <laughs> Strip clubs every yeah, night, poker chips, nightclubs after that. One of the things I found about Vegas is that it's like, you know, I, I, I've lived all over the world. I lived in Milan. I've lived in New York, L.A., London, obviously, I've lived all over the world, and I I never could have imagined that I this would be the town that I found peace, you know. And I found so much peace in Vegas, and I think that it is it is quite strange where in the fact that I've never had more visitors in my life. You know, everyone says, "Oh, I'm, I'll come out and stay with you," right? And then they they really are surprised that there is a community here, and there is, you know, when people say, "How are you?" they actually mean it, and they'll you know they'll converse, and it's just. Yeah, everyone, everyone always sees it as just this transient city that you just come in party in and that's it. And then when you go off the strip, you know, which you're obviously there every week with your show, but when you go off the strip, it's actually, you yeah, can go no. to the mountains, you yeah, can yeah. chill. It's a very slower paced city than... You find that when people come into town that you're like, they're like, what are you doing? What should we do tonight? You're like, yeah. I'm going to bed. I don't know. Watch a, I'm going watch to a bed. movie. <laughs> watch a Netflix <laughs> program. Netflix you know? and chill. Oh, uh, is that a club? No. <laughs> Playing <laughs> PS4. You know? yeah. <laughs> like, that's it. Yeah, everyone. PS4, Siege 6, Tom Clancy, Rainbow Siege 6. That's our jam. <laughs> yeah. Ollie, Ollie just gets killed every night, or is he, he no, do some killing? I've got to be honest, man. I've got credit where credit's due. We're all kind of even keel. We all have. Any any of the gamers watching this, they'll know you'll have a, you'll have a, day, a, a night where you just. S- Slay it, and then you'll just then you'll have an off night. But that's the thing about video games. I'm a big advocate for video games. I don't think it has anything to do with, you know, for me it's just the way. It's me, my brother, check our out little, our little crew. We all meet online wherever we are in the world. We all just meet, and then we'll throw in little. We'll pepper it with business. Yeah, but it won't be as like intense. It will just be the way we all just connect yeah, every night. You're getting along, having fun, chatting yeah. about life, everything, yeah. and then uh, kill shot. Obviously, you know, I remember the first time that we met at a friend's birthday dinner yeah, yeah. randomly. And yeah, I guess if I take a step all the way back, the first time you know I brought my now wife to Vegas, she wanted to go to something that was reminiscent of old Vegas, classy luxury. And at that time, you were playing at the Caesars. And I was, I'd heard all this stuff about this guy, Matt Goss. Yeah, and so I was like, oh, perfect. He's got the Gossy room, everything else. We got dressed up. We went there. You know, I scored that night, so I still owe you one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, with, with her, you know, it was a, an old Vegas sort of show in which, you know, you, you've always remained very true to that Sinatra-esque, classy, Rat Pack sort of era that, that's kind of lost its way throughout a lot of Vegas. And so it's something that I've always appreciated, you know, and I think a lot of people always have an affinity for them. And then... From there, fast forward several years, we were at a dinner and we were just sitting there chatting yeah, with one another. Absolutely. Exactly. And so, uh, yeah, it's great great to have you here. Great to be around one of my friends. Obviously, we always have, whether their calls at 4 a.m. or 8 in the morning or wherever we're at, just yeah, a we strong... we become really, I think people like, we always give each other shit online and <laughs> on Instagram. And I think it's funny that, that we can, you know, you know, give each other jabs. Yeah. And that's why I was, frankly, when I came to Vegas, I wanted to find that camaraderie. And when we met at that at friend's dinner, we, you know, you and I were just, you know, were talking about everything and we became yeah. really fast friends. And I think that that's really, this town should have that. I mean, I don't think that, I mean, there are certain cliques, but I think that the camaraderie in this town is what the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to come to Las Vegas. Yeah. My grandfather used to love the Rat Pack and, uh, and all that and just... I think the camaraderie between fellas and a couple of good girlfriends and just is is a really beautiful thing. It's like, well, I think you know, that's what life's about, you yeah. know, and, and having a good time. You know, obviously there's always a serious part of it, and there's serious things that happen in life. But being able to really connect on every level, like you can have fun and you know tell jokes and make you know fun of one another. You could have a serious conversation. You could have business conversations. And then there's, you know, there's just like that love and affection as though it's like family and brotherhood and those sort of things. And, you know, and so if we take a step back, you're from the UK, 
can you can you just give us you know kind of a ramp up to your story and you know we'll we'll kind of unpack a lot of it in different places because there are certain areas where I think that you know are really interesting and and there's a lot more depth than you know to a lot of people you know whether you're a successful businessman uh whether you're an entertainer singer comedian whatever that may be everyone glosses over what they see on screen or on yeah. stage. And there's a lot more depth to people that people just really don't ever get to see. Uh, a lot of it I saw for the first time, you know, in, in the documentary, you know, that you and, and Luke had, uh, you know, that really kind of shows just the authentic realness and the emotion that just runs through you, your family and the way that you run your businesses and your, your career. You know, how did you, how did you get started? Yeah. Well, it was we were born in I was we were born in me and my brother were born in Lewisham Hospital in London, and uh, Luke was born. They cut the umbilical cord, and I was still in there. But they but then they didn't they didn't they only thought there was one because we yeah. were premature. Uh, uh, we only weighed like three pounds each. It was ridiculous, oh, wow. and uh, and I was in there. My lung collapsed, um, and then all the alarm bells went off, and I always call it as my first entrance. <laughs> you know, and then they put me in an incubator for three months. So I look at that like I had my first place, my studio apartment with room service <laughs> the day I was born. Um, it was a traumatic, uh, you know, my mum and dad had a very tumultuous um, relationship. Uh, they separated when we were five. Um, but my mum was always very upfront with us. She always said, this is the deal. Dad's not coming back. Um, she always told, told us the truth, you know, like sugarcoated anything. And then... Um, do you find like, you know, because, you know, I think a lot of what people talk about, you know, the younger generation, it's not right or wrong. I think that, that people are coddled a lot more. I mean, I even see it in my company here. It's like, you got to walk on eggshells instead yeah, of just shooting listen, it Listen, I was reprimanded. I'm only speaking for myself, so I want to make that clear, but I was, I was uh, smacked a few times and, and reprimanded in that way and got clipped around the ear and just I'm really grateful that I was I was reprimanded by my family and and you know I was a kid you know yeah. kids are kids you know they don't know everything they think they do but you don't and I was taught to respect my elders and my my family and taught to respect grown-ups and then I was they always mum always used to say if you've got something you want to say then say it but don't interrupt wait till we finished and if you want to say something whether it be correct or incorrect or you know, wait and then and then speak, and um, and that's the way I still. I think it's something. Re discipline is a really healthy ingredient for the upbringing of, of children. I think. Yeah. Because otherwise, there's that entitlement which I just really can't bear. Yeah. You know, I don't feel entitled. Yeah. And I know that I still have to work hard, and that was installed within me with my with my mother and my and certainly my grandfather and my aunt Sally. And yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that that's. You know those lessons are, are when you're young, kind of shape you know and give you the foundation as to the tools needed. I think to just be a good person. Well, I think we become the society is becoming so PC yeah. that we're losing our humor, we're losing the flirtation. You know, I say it's a controversial thing, possibly, but I don't need a movement to tell me how to be a gentleman. My mother installed great values within my heart and my blood to you know respect women and respect people and. You know, so although I think it's a very val valid and very, it's a necessity, um, it doesn't certainly really apply to me, you know, and I think there are many people that don't want to be tarred with that same brush. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, it's, you've also got to have the courage to say that, you know, you know, people would not say that on the mic. It's mind, a vulnerability, been, that's why. Yeah, so. but I'm, I've been doing interviews for 32 years in the industry and I feel like it, people are really starving for the truth. I mean, we are too PC. Yeah. You know, I think that um, we have to find a, a happy medium when it comes to interaction uh, with people. I have, a, I have an expression that says, my space is your space and your space is mine. I have the ability right now to say something that would ruin your day. Yeah. Um, and I choose not to, but that you have to be aware that we have this circular kind of yeah, energy around connected. us that can affect, you can affect everyone, a smile or a good morning. You know, I say good morning, please, thank you, and good night is the very, very first steps. Common courtesy is the thing that will bond us as a society. And um, I think when people say, oh, I don't see color, that's not true either. Do you see color? Yes. Do you see if I've, if you've got red hair, if you've got shaved hair, white, black, 
blue, green, whatever it is, we see color. Right. What's important is, does it matter to you? Yeah. Does it matter? That's the key question. I think that do you behave differently because of that? Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the issue rather than just blanket statements that we're a bit, that I think society is making right now. You know, and I think that when you look at the, you know, it, it's fine to have different heritages and, and backgrounds and upbringings and those sort of things. It's fine to be proud. I think of being Greek or Latin or whatever it may be. And you can still have a commonality because you travel the world all the time. You've traveled the world, you know, within your career. And there's the simple things that I see that that you've said. Please, thank you, uh, hello, goodbye, smiling. It doesn't matter what you speak, what your color is, where you're from, whatever it is. It's the universal language that also everyone compassion. Speaks. I think is a big thing. Compassion yeah. is a massive factor. Like compassion is something that that isn't like oh you know just a, an immediate thing. And compassion is something that you you either encompass or you don't. And I think that it's you know if all, you know, such a large chunk of my heroes and the reason why I want to do what I do and the way, the way I want to operate as a, as a singer, as a songwriter, as an entertainer, as a businessman, you know, it, there is definitely not one color or creed that have motivated me. It's, it's a mixing pot. And I think the, it's important to celebrate your heritage, but it's also important to look forward to the excitement of inclusion. Yeah. Inclusion is a very beautiful thing and inclusion um, I always wonder why on black radio, for example, on black radio, that they're not playing the hell out of Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. I mean, well, arguably one of the rock, you know, the God, a rock God. Yeah. And it's just like, there's only because there might be 10 more Hendrix out there. We, you know, yeah, I just you inspire them. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think what you're forward. not, what you're not, what you're not shown or what you're not, um, well, you, you know, if you're not, if you don't experience that, then how can you expect to be influenced by it? Right. I just think we have to broaden our horizons a little bit more and be more inclusive. And and I'm not saying it's in a kumbaya kind of way. I just feel like it should be more, we should be more compassionate and more interested in each other's uh Yeah, if we were all the same, it'd be yeah. boring. Like so, if you yeah. and I are the same place, yeah. same yeah. thing, same everything, we'd be like, what are we going to yeah, talk yeah. about? I have it's no like, idea what we talk about. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey man, hey, <laughs> hey, hey, yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. What do you want to eat for lunch, bro? <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, if I go back to, London days, obviously you had, you and Luke born, raised there. Uh, you mentioned, you know, parents separated at, when you were five years old. How do you, how does one all of a sudden leapfrog into, you know, a massive singing career becoming a cultural phenomenon? Like how, how does that even happen? <clears throat> well, it's funny. This tattoo here says never waste good agony. And it was definitely a painful time for us. And I think we could have, you know, <clears throat> you know, I've never done a drug in my life. I don't smoke. I've never had a cigarette in my life. I'm a really clean living human being and it's also because of the pride that I have that my mother installed within me about, you know, being appreciative and living in a constant place of gratitude. You know, that, that, those trees are green enough for me out there. You know, there's, yeah. I don't need to be enhanced. I feel like the reason why I say that is because I was actually in a strange way grateful and later in life that mum and dad did separate Yeah, because my mum allowed me to be a musician. She didn't, you know, I remember, don't get me wrong, when she said, what are you going to do? I said, I want to be a rock star. She was like, Okay. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, you know, yeah. it was just one of those moments where you could see like that, the desperation of my place, choose another career. But we were like, <laughs> but we, uh, we, we, she credit to my mum, you know, my brother had an MPC electronic kit and they, and they bought me a, a keyboard and, and, um, without that traumatic experience, then we wouldn't have, I just wouldn't be here. My dad actually recently said to me, I don't know if I would have let you be a musician. So it would have been, God knows, you know, yeah, you everything happens for a reason, for a reason. And I think so really we ended up, you know, moving probably a little too much. We moved, I think around 10 times, which was traumatic for us as, as kids because we were constantly moving and having to go into new environments, Reconnect new schools, which is a big deal for kids. So why, why were you moving so much? Like what was like? I don't know. Cousin? I think for many reasons and. It was just, it was, it was not, I mean, it was just that side was not fun for me and my brother. Yeah. But we, um, we have ended, you know, we ended up finding our feet. We joined the, at our first band when we were 12 years old. And, uh, was this still in London? Or it was, uh, it? it was outside London. We had our first band when we were 12. And then, uh, we just had so many terrible, terrible bands and we ended up 
you know, writing songs about the pyramid. I even remember one of the songs, it's called Pyramid. I don't know why, I just thought it was like cool to write a song about Egyptian culture and yeah. the pyramids and I had no idea why I wrote it. <laughs> but, um, but then we had names like, in the movie it says we had names like Caviar. We didn't have a clue what Caviar was, we just knew it was very expensive. <laughs> and then we found out it was fish eggs and then we were like, this is not a good look for us. <laughs> it was just like... So we had all these dodgy names and then our, it was a funny story when we went on stage one time and our manager, our name was Ice, which is pretty rotten as well. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's the corny name, but you're kids, you know, I mean, we were like 14 really years young. old and, and we went on stage and our manager introduced, he said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Pulse 2. He renamed us before we went on stage. <laughs> like, the renamed us Pulse. I'm like, but like, I wasn't that so bothered by it. After yeah. the show, I'm like, I'm like, why the fuck weren't we Pulse One? I mean, what, <laughs> is there another? Is there another Pulse yeah, out there? Exactly. Like, why are we two? Yeah. Like, you've just demoted us immediately. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you right should. Up, just hey, ladies and gentlemen, you check out the other band. Pulse One's a lot <laughs> Pulse better. Pulse One's so much better. <laughs> so much better. They'll be on after the opener here. <laughs> why did you rename two. us and then put the two after it? <laughs> but it's like then we uh, then the manager of the Pet Shop Boys. Um, ended up um, contacting us through a mutual friend and, pro and the, the, actually the guy that produced us, Nicky. Um, and then within two years from that moment, we had our first, so we had our first record contract offer from Arista Records. And it was one of my, you know, Clive Davis is one of my heroes. Still to this day, Clive Davis is one of my heroes. And, the, you know, Whitney and, and just the way that the careers that he's built um, and we had our first offer and the day of the sign-in, they called us. We were 16 years old and they called and they passed on us. Oh. So they passed on us and it was like end of our war. We were like, yeah, that's it. We're, we're never getting sign. another record 16 years deal. Old, like. That's it. Proper job coming up. But we cracked on. A year later, we met Nicky. He introduced us to Tom. And within two years of that record company, Aris the passing us, we uh, we signed to Sony, and within a year of that, we had the biggest debut album in the history of CBS Records. Wow! And so you were how old at this time? Were you 18. Eighteen. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that went on to sell over five, six million copies that one album. Um, You're like Clive, I'm sorry, I love you, bro. But <laughs> no, it wasn't Clive. Clive was in the American division, but there was a guy. To your point, it was uh, it well, there was a guy. It's, it's, it's almost every any musician watching this is like one of those dream moments. Yeah, and it was a. Uh, we were in a restaurant and we were number one in our country uh, and when simultaneously 30 number ones around the world yeah. at the same time. We just knocked ourselves off of number one in Australia. I think the first artist since Elvis. And the guy that signed us was in the restaurant uh, that, that passed on us. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, and we walked past with the, the entourage. It was <laughs> yeah, definitely yeah. like there were paparazzi, a couple hundred people outside <laughs> the restaurant. And he just looked at us and we went, hello, man. He went, I know. I, know. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I know. It. And that's it. all he said. And we just went, we shook his hand. He went, I know. Yeah. That's a, one of those, like the, the best revenge is success. You exactly. Know? And, and it wasn't, we weren't it. actually, Benchful. we almost, we were so naive at that point. We just went, so we did it. You know, we were like, <laughs> now I'm just like, oh, it's a good moment. Well, how did you, so, I mean, you're at a very young age, so you're 16 when they pass from you, your world yep. kind of collapses around you as a 16 year old yep, thinking yep. you're going to be signed. I was just started. Then I was, I just remember fancying my mate's mum that worked in the corner shop. And then she had a toga party. And then I remember having my first little moment of like, she, you know, we had a little, she had a little, we had a little kiss and a cuddle, my yeah. mate's mum. So it was like all the stuff you shouldn't do. I was, you know, <laughs> kiss chase and, yeah. and just it, back then you, you, you would kiss when you were kids, you'd kiss so many girls. Yeah. And then you go, when I grow up, I'm going to kiss the world. Yeah. And then you grow up and you get this thing called a conscience. Yeah. I'm like, where the fuck did that come from? So, what, so what's, then, your, what's and, your kiss number? <laughs> as, as, an ad, as an adult, it's very low. But as a, as a, as a, as a, as a boy here in puberty, it was just, it was it's definitely in the high dozens, dozens <laughs> and dozens. But it was like, it all changes. You, be, you grow up. Yeah, and then conscience. what happened is we became very, very famous. And then there was this thing called consequence and your conscience and just, you just ended up, we became very um, surrounded by the machine. Yeah. So we would travel and there would be 60 people in our team. You that know, were when, when we would go on tour. When you're 18, 19, 20. You know, our, our touring team was yeah. 60, consisted of 60 people. So 
it was, you know, we would have most of the front half of the plane was ours on any plane we went. So how do you, you know, when you, you know, and I'll get to like Justin Bieber just posted uh, a little article on Instagram yesterday where he's, he's talking about, you know, when I was 13 years old, I was from a broken home. Like our, our family was not well, like we didn't have money, those sort of things. Two years later, it's like I have millions of dollars and, you know, it's uh, <clears throat> my world gets turned upside down. And then he was like, I was raised essentially being told I'm amazing. I'm a star, great job, everything handled for you. And you don't, you don't really, he, he, he says like he didn't have consequences or people like actually telling him. And so when you're talking about you, and Luke, like, you're young as well. I mean, you're 16. I remember when I'm 16 years old, all the stupid shit I did, you know, and then looking at, you know, I had great parents who, you know, corrected my bad ways and teach you the right thing to do. But I can only imagine, you know, where you go and 60 people, you have 60 people following you to handle all your stuff while you're on tour. You're, you're, you're 18 years old. Like, it's crazy. Well, I, I don't know. It wasn't the thing for me. I don't listen. I don't know his story. And yeah. that we were, it's also very, very individual for me. Yeah. It wasn't like they're handling what we were doing. If anything, it was the opposite. We were doing 30 interviews a day. So I remember seeing schedules like it said, uh, eight, eight Oh five, eight, eight, 12. It was like that. Yeah, it was crazy. like, it was, back it wasn't to back to back. Yeah, and then you had to do a show in the evening. I think that was the point where we were like, success was a great thing, but we assumed that people back home were taking care of our finances and because we were the machine that were, was, were making the money. Yeah, you're the and, rainmaker. And I think that was the biggest disappointment. We lost, you know, tens of millions, tens of millions of, of, uh, of when we, at the time we were, you know, 23, I think we'd grossed, I don't know, well over 100 million. It was, it was, it was insane. But I think that, that the money that it took to run it and, and but I, the, the crazy thing is I don't even know the numbers. The numbers were extraordinary. But I never really felt like, uh, you know, the fact that I've never done a drug or I've never done a cigarette. Yeah, I but never, that's what I was going to ask you. It's like you're, you're exposed to a world where, I mean, I'm sure everything and anything's at, I've seen it all. I mean, I've seen it all. I've seen, of course, I've of seen course. drugs on cocaine all over a uh, yeah. mixing desk. Uh, I know exactly what band was in there before me. <laughs> and I just went, oh, can you, you know, and it wasn't like I was offended by it. It yeah, was yeah, like, yeah. I was just like, you know what, can you just clean this up? Cause I'm about to make, make uh, record some music. Yeah. It wasn't like, it was just part of the thing. But I think, you know, even the girlfriend I had at the time, we had like rules and it, we tried our best, you know I mean? All the girls I, you know, I would date. It was like, I, went, I remember when I went on a date and the next morning, everything we ordered, what Cara picked her up in, what we spoke about, was on a double page spread in one of the biggest newspapers in Britain. It's very humiliating as a young guy. Yeah. You're like, and then what that does, yeah, it starts no, to chip away at your trust and then you become very self-conscious. So then your conversation becomes self-conscious and then the way that you, um, the way you interact with people becomes heightened and self-conscious because you don't trust you don't know like what's going to leak where are you part are you working with the sun or are you going to turn around well, every one of our pretty much every one of our friends bar two or three every one of our school friends sold stories so you're seeing yeah. stories constantly in the press about and at that point you've got nothing to worry about you, like you're, stupid you're at shit, school but it's yeah. still a humiliating you know the people watch the movies you know i, you know, I, I play conkers you know it's yeah. like you know the, it's uh the the reality is it's 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 there there is definitely um i think the only thing for both myself and my brother that is a direct has been a direct hit on our personalities and who we are is the need that privacy is a possession for us sometimes people think oh they're really private or you don't go out all the time they think you're aloof yeah. or you're arrogant or think we're actually very very private people and we actually really love our own space and we also love our circle of friends right um that's certainly only based on the fact of the absurd desire and need i would say need for privacy in our lives that's the one thing that me and luke has not we've not gone and milked as we say in london we, we've not milked our fame yeah. we only go in when it's valid but whenever we do go in i think me and my brother always create monumental moments but is that is that something because of the way you're raised? Like, like what is it because it was forced upon you? Because there's you know, like you said, the trust was just chipped away. Like, how how does that how does that come about? Because you see now in the world of reality stars, it's like 
I'm going to go here and I'm going to do this. I'm going to sell my baby photos. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do, you know, like what, what causes you to, is it just the way you guys were as brothers and the way your family worked? Like how did, how did that come about to where you well, are? That no, was just a, that was just a very serious, I mean, and that's the right word for it. It was a very serious bond between us and our mother. Yeah. We uh, almost had separation anxiety when mum would leave the room. It would be like, don't leave us, you know, because we thought she was going to leave us. Yeah. So I think that her skill, and it was the only word I can think of, her skill and true wisdom, how to raise two boys exactly the same size with exactly the same needs at exactly the same time. And that's why I have a tremendous respect for single parents because whether they be men or women, it's, you know, I really do have a respect for single parents because um, they, you know, my mum was learning, but she, she had a way about saying like, you know, if you want to smoke cigarettes, that's fine. She said, if, if you just, it, you know, if you can do me two things, know that it will break my heart, but please promise me that you'll smoke the cigarette with me. And I'm like, well, yeah. that's a pretty that's bit of genius reverse psychology yeah, right yeah, there. Yeah. It's like, but yeah, then we go, okay, we can smoke cigarettes. And then you go, oh, but that'll break mum's heart. Yeah. So you, the, 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 the taboo side of anything was removed from our life. Right. Candor, yeah. transparency, the same with friendships, our yeah. friendship, you know, the same with my business partners. People that work with me, there's candor, there's transparency. You have to be, communication is everything, man. Yeah. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a friend, yeah, no you're relationship. your girlfriend, yeah. boyfriend, whatever it may be, it's communication is everything. And ego, I will say ego, destroys everything. Yeah, yeah no, it's, I, I completely agree. And, and you know, when you look at it, one of the things I always say is everybody has their own insecurities, right? Whether some somebody's like, I don't like the way I look, or I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm like this, whatever. I'm short, I'm tall, I'm this, like whatever. Everybody has their is own that insecurities. Your list? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the short, tall, and here. <laughs> I'm too ugly. No, my, I mean, I know I have a big nose. Like that's already. I just, I just yeah, rock it, you know. I'm sure you've learned that to <laughs> take advantage of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll take yeah. that offline. No, I'm just kidding. No, you're right. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, but I, I think like one of the things is, is if you, you know, disarm with your insecurities to people, and you were like to go like. Hey, I know I've done this or I do that or here. It's like, what does anybody have to pass judgment on you now? Now yeah. it's just like raw. Like I'm sitting here naked. Now what yeah. do you want to talk about? You no, know, I think I think also like the people that re rely on me to make good decisions, and the people that work for me, and just uh, it, first of all, you have to be a comfortable with being a boss, which I am. Yeah. Um, but I also that doesn't mean that I I need to always assert my authority. That's yeah. just silly. <laughs> That's just insecure. Like I would rather have like my cast and my band. I would I would way would way rather have their respect. Um, yeah, and, and doing it because they don't want to disappoint you because yeah. they respect you, as opposed to oh shit, I'm scared. Or of more that. importantly, in some ways, disappoint themselves. You yeah, know, I think if you encourage that, um, I'm just a piece of this puzzle, and you know, yeah, I am. I enjoy being the captain of the ship, and I feel like we have to. You know, we have to, you know, you have to be confident in that position. Right. But I feel like, you know, because so often I think you and I have had this conversation that, you know, there's a guilt from people that come from nothing. My, yeah. I will speak for myself. There's a somewhat, there's a guilt that's associated with, with authority sometimes because you want that, those people to know that you do not take them for granted. You're not going to abuse your position of authority. But sometimes you just got to get shit done. Yeah. And there is a point from A to Z and you don't yeah. have to go through the whole alphabet. Sometimes we just see that direct path. And with what I do to stay in the game, you have to be very forthright sometimes. Yeah. And now I feel like the people around me respect that 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 I am a direct person. Yeah. No, I, I mean you and I, you and I talk about it because you carry this guilt, and even if there's success that follows with it, and you you feel as though you have to apologize for where you are, who you are, and what you're doing. And it's not that you're an arrogant, inconsiderate asshole. It's just that. You know, you know what I am here. Here's the reality. I am here. So yeah, now, yeah. now what? But that, that takes okay. some time. I think sitting in that oh, chair takes yeah. some time, and then you go, hold on a minute. Somebody's got to do this. Yeah. And then when you're around people that actually respect your judgment, those people are more important than anyone because those people are, give uh, have confidence in you. Yeah. Which means they're secure in their position. Yeah. So then everything can move forward. It's the people that want to make you feel bad that you have achieved what you have or. You've, you've managed it yourself. Like you've run a very successful company, you know, as your friend, I'm incredibly proud of you. Yeah. And may it, God, may it continue, you know, like may it continue and may you go from strength to strength. 
the fact that you're doing podcasts and you want to venture out, dare to venture out. Like yeah. some people can be like, well, who does Faisal think he is? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you who Faisal thinks he is. He's somebody that wants to experience more in life and, yeah. and he's got another challenge. You're still learning about this medium. I've done thousands yeah, and thousands so you're, of you're like the ex, We've talked about it. You're like <laughs> what I ask you, you're like, hey, what do you do? How do you do right. that? You're like, here's what you need to do. Here's where you can improve that. Stop right, doing right. this. You know, those sort of those sort of things. But also be you, you know, it's yeah. like anyone that really loves you is going to want you to just be you. Yeah. You, you know? know, you know, for me, like one of the things is, is that it's more interesting just getting to connect with people than anything else. Yeah. You know, and actually find, I, I'm, I'm so intrigued by people and their stories and why they make the decisions or made the decisions in their lives and like what makes them tick because everybody has like something interesting within them. And most don't ever feel comfortable actually articulating it or don't share it or, you know, there's, there's a multitude of things. And that's why with you, you know, it, it's one, the sincerity of like our friendship. And when, when we speak and when I speak to you, there, there's just the, an authentic nature to it, to where it's like, we can cut the bullshit. I mean, you go, yeah, you have <laughs> you got, the knife. <laughs> got the knife, got the them. knife here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can speak to that in a minute. Yeah, but, we will. You know, well, but, I'll say about you is as well, it's like, you know, that, that, there's a vulnerability about you and I that we've acknowledged. And I think people that see <clears throat> will see, see weakness in that are people that you must avoid at all costs. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, I think that when you can actually say out loud that how grateful you are for a friendship, I'm, you know, it's hard as a fella. Yeah. Got, it's really hard for guys yeah. because we're, we are in, it's installed in us. Yeah, that machismo like, thing. Tough and listen, you can still, listen, I'm really, really not, I'm, I'm a really able-bodied person, yeah. And but I I, I like the, the my guys around me, my fellas around me. They're all they're all really uh, just respectful, cool, considerate, go above and beyond. TJ Levin, Ollie Rowland, yeah. Luke Goss, um, <clears throat> Rob Ferguson, you know, Steve Guest. These there there are people in my life, you know, and then the some of my newer friendships, people like Bernie Human in, in Las Vegas and Larry Ruvo and <clears throat> people that I really, and Ed Bernstein and just yourself, there are people that are just, you just, I'm constantly inspired in some way by people that, that just around me, not people that have, uh, that have maybe less authority or yeah. don't have as, but they got more money, less money. It doesn't really, I'm constantly inspired around by the people around me. Yeah. And I think, <clears throat> One thing I would never want to do is only be inspired by, by people that have money. Um, yeah, well, it's very, like very, 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 it's yeah. a poor, it's a poor <laughs> and a very, very, it's a real lack of um, wisdom. You can learn so much um, because I've been up, I've been down, I've had money, I've lost money. Um, but it's always the relationships in my life that give me happiness. Yeah. It's always that gives me the happiness. Well, so if I if we if we go back, I mean, speaking of like highs and lows, and you know, when I watched your documentary, which is also all over Emirates, it's still there. I I, right. I actually played it again, and I saw I counted there were seven people watching in uh, business class right. uh, the last flight that I took from uh, Dubai to LA. So I was like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that, you should watch. Trust that. me, you should be you on a plane when the person next to you is watching your movie. <laughs> it's uh, you start, yeah. you're just kind of get. <laughs> Trying to get the, bl- get the <laughs> you're blanket like, yes. over, you're like, mm. yeah, look at that. It's quite a strange experience. <laughs> yeah, I can and you're only like, people, imagine. Are, people are crying. You're like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I love you, Luke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you know, if you go like when when the, you guys when the band like broke up, you know, like you and your brother, and I remember you said, you know, when you received the call and you knew it was just like over, and and you know. What what is that like? And and to go through that, I mean, I think that that would be you're there with not just your brother, your twin. Well, and how about then, how about this? I'll break it down real simple for you. Your yeah. brother walks in now and says, uh, "The company's done." Yeah, and that's the, you, yeah. and you know that that's a fact. It's yeah. not about you don't just you know you don't liquidate. You don't you have to liquidate this company. It would take some time. Yeah, you can might be have a couple of conversations, but. Um, it was an, it was like an immediate liquidation of a company, like immediate, effective, now. It was breathtaking. It was uh, it was something where you go because I actually Luke, you know, listen, Luke's Luke thought that I wanted out of the band um, because there was all these rumors about me going solo and all that stuff. And but was, but don't you have it? And excuse me for cutting you off. Like I mean, that's your brother. You guys are 
from 802 to 813 and then from 824 to here. I mean, you guys are around each other all the time. Like, weren't you able to just be like, oh my God, here's another bullshit rumor coming from whatever. You know? No, no, no. Well, this is the thing. This is what people have to understand. Now, you, myself, the podcast, Instagram, Twitter, social media, it's a network. So there's no middle, there's no middleman anymore between you and the people that will see this. I'm in no way intimidated by this medium anymore. And it's, it's, the, it's, it's a very comfortable place for me to be. But back then, if somebody said something about you, it would be in a national newspaper. Right. Therefore, that national newspaper would be read by the DJs, by the news. It would be on the news. It was, it was considered a source. It was news. Like a credible source. It, but, it was, but, it, but the only way that you could say, well, this is absolute bullshit, would, it would, you would be, have to wait for the next interview. Now that might seem like, okay, wait to the next, correct it. But what you're doing is you're continuously. Like going, coming out, no, coming out. You, no, you're continuously it. correcting and defending. Yeah. So correcting, defending, correcting, defending, correcting, defending. It becomes exhausting. So when you're doing the mass, mass interviews that we were doing, um, and then somebody would just make up a story and then, which they did, we had to sue and yeah. we, we won. Um, but it was, it's, it's a very challenging thing. If we'd had social media then, the one thing now that journalists are a lot more accountable to what they write because the artist can go and say, hey, I didn't say that. That's not yeah. true. Da, 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 da. And you can correct it immediately. Right. And honestly, most fans actually would prefer to hear from you through your socials now than in interviews in many ways. Um, not this kind of stuff where it's a right. lot more in depth, but um, we didn't have the luxury of... of um, Director, direct to consumer, direct to fa direct to your fans, right? Direct to it was people the, that the gatekeeper, but also direct to people that, did, that weren't fans, you know. Right. So they could actually get a sense of who you were and and your sensibility. And this sensibility hasn't changed within me since I was a kid. But um, back then there was a middleman. You literally had to go. It was like somebody just coming up and punching you on the jaw, and you'd have to take it and go, "Yeah, well, I got punched on the jaw last week, so I, I want to, you know." explain and then you just have it was a constant for five years it was we there was there was no social media just to be clear yeah well so then did that did that ultimately like cause friction between you and your brother no no, no they they what said is? the story that broke camel's back was they said um bros enter at number nine in the charts is this the end of bros and it was like Luke was like, to me, like in later years, he said to me, I could just see the writing on the wall. Like, how can a number nine record be considered considered any form of failure? Like failure. There would have been a time when we would have dreamt of having a top 10 record. <laughs> yeah. And because we didn't go into the top three or the top five, it was just the end of Bros. And it was just, no, it was, it was, a, it was a single later in the, in, the, in the second record. And it was like, you know, back then we would sell, you know, Single wise, just in our country alone, we would sell six hundred thousand singles just in our country. I mean, you should go and do some research and yeah. just. I mean, I think the number one record in America uh, has done, actually sold less than sixty thousand in America. So, just yeah, in the, our country alone, I think you should do the math. But I'm, yeah. the numbers are so small now, and um, we were we were selling six five to six hundred thousand singles in our country alone, then you do the other territories. And if you look at some of our stats, it's quite remarkable that the, the, the units well, even, that we sold. Even the audiences and the speed in which you sold out arenas and Well, we and just stadiums. sold out. I mean, <laughs> even recently, we just, we're just we still the youngest men, uh, to, the quickest sellout in history of the O2 nights at the O2. So, you know, seven seconds at the O2. Me and my brother just did it. And then also we are That's still crazy. we are still the youngest men in music I'm gonna history. Call Ollie. To headline. <laughs> We're still the still the the youngest men in history, music history, uh, to ever headline Wembley Stadium. Um, wow. Who was your opener? Seventy seven thousand. Salt and Pepper. Oh um, my God! Salt and Pepper. Fr my love friend it. Debbie Gibson, still one of my yeah, dearest yeah. friends. Um, yeah, but we had a couple of bands, but it was a it was a big 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 show. Yeah. Seventy seven thousand people. So if you look at, I mean, what is it like playing in front? I mean, are you looking at them like uh, in their underwear, the 77,000 people? Yeah. <laughs> like, what, what is it like? I go out of underwear. <laughs> um, no, I've never been that way. I've never, I've, I've never really had stage fright. I mean, it's taken me 
30 years to say this out loud, but I've mastered my trade. Yeah. I really know what I'm going to do to an audience. Yeah. And so, and the funny thing- Are you thing, playing so on the emotion team. or like how, like, how do you know? No, I think it's, I think it's truth, man. I think when people see what you, I mean, if, if I, I never go out and just sing the songs. Yeah. I communicate with my audience. We connect because I'm interested. I'm interested in people like you said before. Yeah. I really am interested in people. And I'm also interested. And I have a thing when I go on stage, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a really bad mood. It's going to be a good show. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm, if I'm pissed off, I'll be like, I'm in a bad mood. It's going to be a really good show. Tonight. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it is what it is. I don't want to do hokey stuff. I just, yeah. what you see is what you get. And I think, yeah, mate, yeah, I was in a boy band when I was a young, young kid, but I've, I've surpassed many, many records and things that I've could only have dreamt of. I've done outside of the band. And, um, you know, even, you know, playing for presidents, playing for the queen, playing, a vice presidents it's just the incredible thing yeah. and playing at Carnegie Hall with the Tokyo String Quartet you know it's an incredible thing to be there and, the, and being the maestro suite and that's what I think well, the rich one history, of the biggest yeah. misconceptions is it's like yeah Wembley Stadium is amazing the O2 is amazing you know with my brother you see it on the movie I, reckon, I hope people if you haven't seen the film check out the film because it's a powerful film but when the screaming stops we've got to get after the really, screaming yeah, stops okay, yeah okay. it's available on Amazon, iTunes, just check it out. It's it's a uh, on the it was, Emirates it, flights in the on every every section. every airplane up there is on there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I think one of the biggest misconceptions is it it, it it it. I know it's a cliche, but it's the journey, not the destination. Like, what would I give? Not how can I how can I explain what it's like to play at the Kennedy Center? Yeah, you know, um, and also be uh, lucky enough to be raising money for you know, breast cancer. Right. Um, and to meet all these incredible people, how do I explain to, uh, the Tokyo String Quartet and a piano in, um, in Carnegie Hall? And I'm in the maestro suite looking at the secret windows in the dressing room, looking at the audience. That's or crazy. recently, 50,000 so people. I, I've never, I've never been there. So you're looking at a secret where the, can you explain that real yeah, quick? Yeah. When you're in I the mean, maestro suite at Carnegie Hall, I'm sorry, Carnegie Hall, if I'm not meant to say this, but there's a, there are little windows in the maestro suite where you can actually see the audience. So there are secret windows that were tiny where you can actually either like scare yourself and be like, oh, you know, <laughs> you're like, uh, or you're you know, like, oh, but, yeah, it, but it's like, it's just an incredible, but it's, you know, when I played the, uh, the Royal Albert Hall, one of my favorite, easily, easily in my top three favorite venues in the world to play the Royal Albert Hall in London. Um, and I never forget that, that, you know, a friend of our families and certainly my brother's, my brother's wife say on all of his records, um, George Michael, uh, he was playing the night after me. So he, I played the Royal Apple when George was playing the night after. So I did a little, and it's probably still there. Yeah, yeah. So if you're watching, there's probably still a little note that I pushed behind the mirror <laughs> at the Royal Albert Hall. So if any bands are playing the Royal Albert Hall and you're in the, the Lee Jessen room, take the uh, behind the message. I actually left a message from, from, from my brother's wife, Shirley. I left her a little message because I'd played there the night before. I don't know how you, how you to explain that those moments, um, they're priceless. Yeah, man. No, you can't, you can't put a dollar amount on them. You can't. Maybe, and so. also it doesn't compare. It's not, you can't compare it to the number of records sold. It's an experience that you can only play the Royal Albert Hall if you can fill it. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, I mean, that, that tells you right there. So there must be though, you know, this, it, these release of endorphins that come from being on stage. Yeah, I call it yeah. the hit. The hit? I call yeah. it the hit. You come out on stage, first of all, where you know the audience, just it's an immediate kind of reaction. So there's no thought process. Yeah. It's like, and you get yeah. this big cheer. Yeah. And it's like, and then flash, 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 camera, all the guy, everything goes on. And you feel energetically. I'm a very spiritual person. I believe in energy, energy in every way. I think, you know, everything consists of it. And, and I feel like um, it, it's you get that hit. It's definitely like I feel it in my body. Yeah. And and I, you go out and it, and you can hear it on the thing, and it, and it cuts off before the, the peak of the, yeah. the noise. And it's just it is somewhat addictive. It is. It's not an adoration thing. It's almost like let's yeah. get this done. Yeah, you know, yeah, let's yeah. have a let's let's connect and let's transport people. Let's transform people's days. Well, the and, power and the power that you have over that audience to like change and make that moment so special and like you said transform them yeah and, and transport yeah. yeah transport i think that we've all got bills we've all got worries we've all got 
stuff going on in our lives. And I think the beautiful thing about music, because it is real time, you you don't think of anything. You know, I'm not getting emails on stage. I'm not getting <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. text messages, and nor are they really. Yeah. You know, they're just, we're in the moment. And I think if you respect the audience and you connect with them and you're truthful and there may be a story that you, or something you experienced that day or that week that you want to share. Yeah. Then, I mean, one thing you must never remember, there's this, the audiences are very intelligent. Like, you know, they're not just your quote unquote fans. Yeah. They're individuals, they're professionals, they're successful, they're- If things going on in their they've lives. They've got stuff going in their lives. So sing to them as that's who they are. Yeah. You know, they want to digest the information that, and there's a connection. Unfortunately, you can't <laughs> hand the mic over, but at least you can give them respect of being truthful about your life and then it, let it be entwined with the music. And then it becomes something- People that come to my shows will know exactly what I'm talking about because yeah. we do have a laugh. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, you're, you're, you know. you're very charismatic and you connect uh, in a very authentic manner. So when you when you have like that, the hit come through and then there's those gap between performances, yeah. like how, how does- That's how a do good you, question. How do that, you manage through that? That's a good question. Uh, I think that's the most challenging thing for any any performer because the silence is absolutely definite. Yeah. It's like, you know, you're like, what do you do? It's like- Right. And cool. it's, it's just, it's the, it's the strangest thing. Like even my show here, like I will drive with my executive assistant, Ashley Jurisic. She's, she's always aware. Like we are both kind of in this zone for a, three minutes where we're in the car. Cause I like driving home. I think, well, we're just coming off of that whole machine that had yeah. to happen and, and the experience in the show and, and the meet and greets. And I mean, Again, like people don't know not to be a downer, but like the last meet and greet I had on Sunday, this Sunday just gone, the lady in my meet and greet had a bucket list because she had two months to live. And she, and I held her for 10 minutes and I stopped, the, I stopped the meet and greet line and we, I just held this lady for, for 10 minutes. And how, how on earth did I get that lucky to be that human being? the show doesn't exist at that moment. Now you're looking at another side of entertaining and you go for, to into a meet and greet situation. And now times that by a hundred of those every, every year. So there are moments full of those moments, not necessarily two months to live. Right. But <clears throat> you'll get people that come and share their life with you. There was a lady who recently just came, she got divorced she said, I'm, I'm, this is a place of, of great mem beautiful memories for me, Vegas. And I, I thought, I want, to, I want to make memories of my own. And I came here, extended her flight and came again. She just and made new friends. And that's another thing that happens in my universe. Right. People make friends. People have, I mean, you ask the question on your social, like yeah. what the MGA is, the yeah. Megosami says, you know, um, they, there's, there's communities all over the world. I mean, it's 32 years. That's what it does. Yeah. There is a, there is a, there is a little army out there that just really are supportive of each other. No, and, I, I think you know. it's incredibly powerful when, when you look at that. And, and I think that one of the things that speaks to your character is you're very delicate with that, you know, and you're very mindful of it, you know, and, and very self-aware of the impact you can have both positive and negative, because you could be a diva right there and just be like, sorry, we got, 10 more people that need to have a photo. So go, I'm sorry, that's great. Bye. And then go there. But you, you sense the moment and just have that emotional connection as a person. Which... We FaceTime. Thank you. We FaceTime my brother. Oh. So I said, let's FaceTime. So Luke was on the phone. So I took a screenshot of me, her and Luke on FaceTime. And, uh, the fact that this woman was in tears of joy. Yeah. If that is not humbling, if that is not educational yeah. and must prepare you to all of our mortality, yeah. her grace, her grace and strength to find joy at a time of, of that time in her life um, was nothing but humbling and is still with me now. And that's what's different about when you're in the business for so long. You know, three decades I've been doing this and I've got things we're working on now that frankly the biggest things I've ever worked on um, so it's, there isn't, um, I live in a absolute genuine place of wonderment yeah. and, or I never check in. We've had this conversation as well, but for the sake of the interview, yeah. you know, when I check into a hotel room, I'm still like, 
Yeah, and that's what I love about you as well. I genuinely love that about you. Like I see the wonderment when you walk into a beautiful room and you're like, this is great. And God knows how I many, we yeah, have yeah. both lived our life in hotel rooms. <laughs> but I'm always like the world, whether it be the car I drive or the hotel I stay in, I'm like, how am I so still this lucky? I'm so fortunate. Don't get me wrong. I work very, very hard. Yeah, you deserve it, but it's still you still have gratitude every step of the way. And I think the minute the minute you stop having gratitude, you've lost your way. Hundred percent. Yeah, and that's but personal, materialist things, whatever it ends up being. If you don't have gratitude for the day, and that's just starts by when you wake up. You know, but like, also, I have I'll day. also say on the, on, the, on the flip side, I think people are so sometimes. I think forced modesty is really not good either. And no, I, think I that, agree with you. On and that. I think that it's okay to want the the car of your dreams i hope that you know the culture in, in in britain i'm such a proud brit and i'm even more proud londoner but one of the things in britain i would always urge people in britain to is to be really prideful of it. If, if your friend wants you know a, a 488 ferrari or whatever they want or they want a, a rolex or they want something material as long as that thing doesn't define you that's the encourage 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 yeah because we have nerve endings on our fingers. Enjoy a touch. Enjoy being tactile. And as long as it's not the center of who you are. I watched recently, I watched recently um, on a car show, I believe. I forget what it was. And they said, oh, well, this Lamborghini obviously screams of somebody that wants attention. Yeah. It's an appalling thing to say. Yeah, I don't think that's true. I think why, if you're driving that kind of car, you're screaming for attention. Maybe that's what you've, you, one of your dreams. Maybe that's what uh, you want. Maybe yeah. you just love. I know how I feel. I, I don't have a Lambo, but I know I have a couple of beautiful cars, and I don't, they're not for for anyone to see. They're for yeah. I love them. Yeah, you know. And it's like I think that you should. We should also be more encouraging of because there's a kind of there's a, a guilt attached to having nice things. Yeah, and that's another really fucked up kind of um, philosophy that is not allowing your true authentic self. Like how about somebody gets out of Lamborghini and has got a good heart, you know, like yeah, it's the most it's, gracious, it, kindest you know, person you know, in the world. It's very, very, very ignorant to, to try or, and suppress. Or that that's like been their dream. They finally achieve it and they have two months left to live. And that's yeah, what they want. We, like, yeah. do like, the, we don't the know thing people's is, story, right? Exactly. Like my thing is, is that it, it all comes down to judgment and people pass judgment every day, whether it's the color of your hair, the shirt you're wearing, the car you drove up in, you know, the hat that you're wearing, whatever it may be, everybody just jumps and, and makes a judgment most of the time. It's just like human nature without any context. It's like, I don't know, like if I, if you were walking down the street and I don't know you from a hole in the wall, like who the fuck am I yeah. to make any judgment about anything about you? I understand. And it's a good point, but I understand if somebody wants to make that immediate assumption, we've all done it, right? We've yeah, all done of it. Of course. But I think, I think it's, and I also even understand some of the, preconceptions about me yeah yeah maybe they think i'm you know whatever and a ladies man or whatever it, it, what, you know whatever it may be yeah you know but we so i understand that it's whether somebody wants to take the time to actually find out who i am if you if you know that the lay the layout of my home and the sensibility behind my family the people around me know exactly how important they are to me there's not a doubt in my mind they know what they mean to me and they know what my family means to me. And they also know what loyalty means to me. Yeah. And onto the, uh, the knife, I would imagine this is, you there are one go. of the blades. Exactly. So do you want to explain this? Cause this, well, this is, is a is, wedding gift that this that is, I want to give it a shout out to a company that I love. It's called William Henry knives. And uh, you know, I'm not a big knife fan or, or, but I do love things that are beautifully made. This is made by artisans. This is a Damascus blade folded over 200 times by uh, two, a Japanese, Japanese uh, father and son. And my friend Matt, that actually originally owned William Henry, um, the company, um, we became great friends. And then there are, I, I ended up buying one and buying two. And then the people that I really love in my life, <clears throat> we call ourselves the Blaze because we cut away the shit. We cut away. If, if I'm in trouble, I know I can call, I would call you. Somebody asked me yesterday, I said, I, I know I could call you in a second. And yeah. I, I know you know the same about me. Yeah, likewise. And it's just a symbolism. And we have this thing where we text each other and the text is blades out, ladies and gentlemen. And if you don't send a text with your with your blade, um, you get the next dinner. 
So as you can imagine, I have a lot of tight friends. So the pictures come in real fast. They come in real fast. Wherever you are in the world. But it's really, uh, Time zone's not an excuse. No, it's not an excuse. Yeah. In fact, it's a benefit. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes, paying your benefit. Oh, he's asleep now. Let's send this text. Um, but it really is, it is I'm, I'm all about old school camaraderie and old school acknowledgement of friendship. And uh, and I just, yeah, this is this is a sign of our, our love and our friendship as, you know, yeah, no, it's amazing. I remember. Yeah, we, so, Matt, I think that you know one of the things we haven't touched on is, you know, you've you've run multiple businesses, and now you know another venture that you've moved into is you've come out with your own champagne. Right, right. So, what, what obviously, what's the story behind that? Like, why? You know, I I, always, I know the story, but you know, why 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 was it important for you, and what was sort of the premise behind creating you know your champagne? Well, I, it's it's one of many many things I want to say. Premises, it's one of many many things that I want to do in in regards to retail and <clears throat> products. And it really is the phrase on the bomb at uh, the back of the bottle is luxury is inclusive, not exclusive. And I have also lived a life. Obviously, I've seen a lot of luxury, but I've also seen been around people in my life that manufacture. And it always amazes me that the brand is an incredible thing. And sometimes you look at something and you know that this company may make sunglasses for an array of companies, both low end and high end. But yeah. they this these guys get charged these and these guys charge this. And I and I I want to do it with clothes, I wanna do it with fragrance, I wanna do it with everything where I can actually create something. And when I did the champagne, I really, really wanted a beautiful bottle. Like I wanted the bottle to look beautiful. I wanted the, I just made a decision, a small decisions, and you will know whether yeah. it's as a foil, foil label, or just uh, whether it's embossed. All these things take pennies and and cents from your from your overall profit. Right. Um, the my logo, everything about it. I just wanted it to be. If it was, listen, the guy that's coming in and going to buy the bottle of Krug Rose, he's already made that decision. But the guy next to him that is looking at the menu going, um, looking at the prices, it's always heightened. I wanted to create something that was beautiful, that can compete with anything. Yeah. Tastes amazing, but also is it that, that man is immediately included and can afford one or two or three bottles and, and have a nice night out without breaking the, uh, breaking the bank. Yeah. I, that's what I want to do with suits. I want to do it with um, fragrance. I want it to do with a lot of things. I know a lot about this stuff over the years. I'm, and I, I mean it in a way, it's one of my passions, truly. Yeah. Fashion is one of my passions, fragrances. You definitely know how to dress, well, except for your shirt today. But Thank you. A... Well, I just, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what We're was clashing. It's kind of nice. I actually have the same one. But, there's but, uh, a... <laughs> but I feel like, I feel like, it was, so I wanted to start something that also I have a showroom. Obviously, I have my own showroom here. And it makes sense for people to be, be drinking my bubbly, right? So yeah. it's also an extension of the experience. Um, well, you've designed you've designed rooms like you have rooms in other parts of the world the gossy room yeah yeah I mean yeah, I think it's not, that it's not yeah. your first foray into yeah I want to get more into I, I I I think I've experienced enough of life to have a real solid vision on things if so I want to get into that a lot more I do want to design suites and in hotels and and I want to I had this idea where you know have a, a the red carpet that will take you to all things gossy, you know, in a weird way, like just that way you can experience the best food and beautiful, you know, beautiful rooms and beautiful showrooms. I just want people to know what they're getting. If you buy a Matt Goss suit, then I know I want people to know that they're, that I've taken a, a lot of care in making sure that, that it's just the highest tailoring possible for that price point. Right. Obviously tailoring is a limitless thing and I enjoy it as well. And I, when I go back to London, one of the things I love to do, and it's actually great to see that the, 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 the fellas in my team actually uh, go out and enjoy it, start to enjoy it. And we go out and we buy some, some you know, tailored shirts and <clears throat> a couple of tires. I think there's not a lot of we the fellas have, but you can have a lot of fun as, as guys in the way you dress. But I also believe you should, you know, my whole thing is tattoos and tuxedos. I don't think it should just be linear. Yeah. You know, from the, from the, the second you get up, all the way to casual, semi-casual, smart, all the way through to tuxedo and it ending at the pool. Yeah. I think you should look like the same guy, that you have a sensibility. And I often see guys that gray <laughs> in a suit and then they fall apart either side of that, <laughs> that realm, you know. And and I just, it really, really uh, intrigues me, both 
male and female, I'd love to get into that whole lifestyle brand. And it's something I'm very passionate about. And probably in the next 10 years, 10 years, I want to, I would like to start to grow that. No, that, yeah, it's amazing. Tastes amazing. And uh, yeah, no, I'm proud of you. I mean, Thank you, I know how much work and thought went into that because yeah. there's endless discussions around changing this. Yeah, and yeah. I remember we're sitting at lunch and you know, you're like, I get, I'm like, go ahead. You know, yeah, you're yeah. Like, no, this yeah. one, that foil doesn't look good. You can't do that. We have to do it like this. But I enjoy it. You know, my, yeah. my, my team always call it gossify. You know, I just gossify things. Yeah. You know, it's like, and, uh, and I do it with love, man, as well. Like my mates will come many, many a time said like, you just, do you mind? I've got, got this thing. I've got to look great. I'm like, I'll, we'll go out and I'm like, boom, 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 done. You know, you know, there's a skill to it, you know. To, yeah. But I also think again, uh, wanting, wanting to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I love to do it. I love to see that moment with transformation where somebody just feels better about themselves. It makes me very happy. Yeah. It does. That's it. It's a very powerful thing and it's very rewarding, yeah. you know, in that regard. So, yeah, I was at the 10 year anniversary show over right. at the Mirage packed house. Uh, I think Ollie gave away my seat three times, but you know, we ended up, he sorted it out because he made it right. <laughs> that, with means tequila. that means you're, one, you're <laughs> yeah. part of the crew, man. We actually ended up having the best seat by the end of it. You know, so it was, it was great. But that, you know, within that night you were honored. Do you, can you speak about, you know, you, you were honored, uh, you know, and given a reward, an award. And, and it was something that I don't think a lot of people know about you. And, and I think it speaks to your character and it's the stuff that goes on behind, you know, behind the camera, uh, when the camera's off actually, that, that really makes you who you are and the humanitarian you are. Can you speak to some of that? Um, I think that it, it was a, just a very prideful moment. I got the United Nations Humanitarian Award, um, and the Royal Medal, for the same thing. Um, there are times I think you do feel a little bit invisible and it was one of those moments I think I got a little bit choked up on stage because it, you, somebody, Sandro, uh, and a friend that, that, that noticed some of the work that I'd done and and hopefully I will always be able to continue to do uh, is to raise awareness and money for, for chari certain charities that I'm involved with. Um, it was just one of those moments where I felt, I felt like I wasn't invisible in a weird way. Yeah. Cause I feel like some people may just see that guy, you know, singing and whatever, but there's more to my heart than that. And it was just one of those moments where I felt recognized. Um, trust me. Um, you are, there is a little bit of like bashful kind of like, wow, this is, you know, but at the same well, time, I mean, that's a big deal. <clears throat> so you should, there is, is some a bashfulness. Big... I mean, it's a huge deal. And, and to be recognized like that, especially, I mean, you're, your, your life on stage and those sort of things and being a celebrity is very public like in that regard. But it's all the stuff that's happening that others can't see, you know, every day. And to be recognized for that, I mean, that's got to be something. Well, it's, that, it's just, first of all, thank you for your words. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, with some of the work I did for Susan G. Komen, for example, you know, yeah, I played for, I played for Susan G. Komen in, in, in um, Philadelphia on the Rocky Steps, the 120,000 people. Um, we've done LA, you know, myself and Halle Berry co-hosted 120,000 people. Just crazy. But the difference is, it's not the performance. The performance is very powerful because I wrote their theme. I wrote their uh, national anthem called Strong. And um, if you download it, in fact, all proceeds go to uh, Susan G. Komen. But... Um, when you walk around 120,000 people with, you know, Nancy uh, Brinker, who is formed the charity in honor of her sister who passed, Susan G. Komen. So Nancy is a very, very dynamic woman. And we, when you walk around and you see every single person of that 120,000 people have been affected by that or have lost somebody or is currently going through that, it can get very, very um, emotionally depleting. So yeah. that's just a, a little bit. So why I'm bringing it up is, is that those people are around that every single day. So those are the people reality. that should be, you know, although I'm very honoured by the award, those are the people that should be honoured because it, it's very, very, very challenging to see that much um pain but also that much courage it, it's it's a dichotomy you're like 
you, you feel such sadness and such inspiration by these people. What also makes you, I'm sure, realize, I, I know from my seat, is that whenever you think you have something bad going on, it's not that bad. Right. Like there's somebody who has it worse. And yeah. so like quit, quit complaining. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, I'm going to disagree with you on that one. I think <laughs> that pain is rel relative. I think the important thing is compassion. If you said, Matt, I'm in pain, I don't really care what it is. Yeah. If my friend's in pain, I don't care if it's to, be, to do with the, the, your dog food. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mind what it is because usually there's an underlying True. source of pain. So I would say pain is, you know, there's always, you know, there are people starving in the world and we're not, thank God. But we must always understand that pain is relative. So as soon as anybody says they're in pain, how can I help? Yeah. What do you need? No, I yeah. think that that that's again speaks to just who you are and the way that you approach, you know, humans and interacting with humans and having compassion for everyone, rich, poor, irrespective of their backgrounds, whomever they are. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. I'm a big believer of inclusion. Inclusion is everything to me. And I was, and I say this on, I say this, uh, you know, common courtesy, you know, just to round this off, like good morning, please. Thank you. Good night. Love your love, love your neighbor. Go and check on your neighbor at Christmas. Make sure nobody that you know is by themselves. It's simple decisions, man. Like, yeah, hey, you got anywhere to go? You know, make it easy breezy. But yeah. hey, you got anywhere to go on Christmas Day? No, I, I, well, you're invited. Yeah, make sure people aren't alone on key holidays. We make, talked about that. Yeah. Remember when I, we were, you ended up having it was Thanksgiving, I think, last yeah. year, you know, and you were like, you you it's end up having out. people around, but it's like, hey, I we don't call know. Them if you strays. Have... We call ourselves <laughs> the strays. We are all the strays. But but when I'm in my my house is is a good house for is for social gatherings and just. But if you're a stray, you're welcome at my house. You know, yeah. it's like we we really uh, an in because of doing that. Then you, we have like uh, something that people don't feel like they're imposing. Yeah, it's just what we do. So when we come full circle here, it, you just celebrated your 10 years in Las Vegas, yeah. uh, which is crazy uh, yeah, because is. nobody lasts in Vegas 10 years. No, I know, <laughs> like I know. Not even the kings of kings, you know, the, yeah. the Elvises of the world, et cetera. And so you know, you're, you're really still at the top of your game. You know, can you speak to 10 years in Vegas and you know, wh what that means to you, what that means to the city? And then, you know, what's, what's on tap next and, you know, what else is there for Vegas for you here? Well, I think, first of all, I've never learned more in any place than Las Vegas. Las Vegas has taught me so much about being an entertainer. If you can maintain composure in Las Vegas on stage, you can play anywhere. Because the, you, you just can't imagine what you see in an audience sometimes. But I have managed to turn that experience, whatever happens out there, Yeah. I've turned it into the show and it becomes a show. And I think the audience are in on it all the time. The second you exclude of an audience is the second you lose them. Yeah. <clears throat> so it does take an immense amount of, com of composure to go out and handle all aspects of this town. Yeah. <laughs> and I think <laughs> it's, it's, it's a composure that this town has also taught me because of that very thing. So it's also given me peace after my mother's death. Um, this town like wraps its wings around me, man. That's all I can say. Las Vegas yeah. wraps its wings around me. And I didn't even want to sing anymore. And this town made me sing. Yeah. This town made me sing again. Was I, was on, I was on Good Morning Britain. Uh, sorry, I was on, the, let me say, I was on Good Morning America three days after mum died because it was booked. And then I was on stage seven days after she, she was buried. I, I don't even know how you, you, you know, even it's the thing that, that saved me. Frankly, I was either, I was either going to find, I was either going to find a substitute and numb my life. Yeah. Or I was going to get on and make my mum proud. And there were many a nights that I'd got off stage and just got into my car and just wept because I just felt guilty. But I knew somehow inherently within my heart and my blood that I knew that I had to get back on stage and credit to my beautiful audience. I mean, seriously, it, people really don't understand how hard it is to continue to put bums on seats for 10 solid years. Um, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. I'm so prideful and I'm so grateful 
I'm so humbled that audiences still come out to see me sing and do me do my thing. It's a uh, it's it's something that you know. I asked my manager, are we, "Are we doing?" He's like, "Great." You so know, how, it's, it's, how do you after after ten years? I mean, you just said it there. After ten years, what motivates you to get up and get on stage? It's like you have another show coming up. Sunday. It's like what? I mean, is it you know people get burnt out? I mean, ten years is a long time to be doing anything. No, it's 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 one of the most peaceful places on earth to me is the stage. That again, going back to what I said, no emails, no texts, no business, no worries. Yeah. Um, most people, 99.9% of people understand that that's a sacred place. Um, I have a job to do. When they say, you know, you know, the show must go on. I mean, there have been moments when I could not go on. <clears throat> I recently fell. I still have an injury, but <clears throat> I still go on stage because um, if I don't, um, there's a part of me that is, it feels like is missing. Yeah. I don't need it as in an unhealthy way, but I just, this... If if you come to one of my shows, it, it it's it transports people, and again, the last Sunday was very very powerful Sunday. So to hold somebody that I know really that I may never see again, um, and to have so much love off stage, you know, just in a meet and greet, not to mention the show, is <clears throat> is 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 there's a point zero 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 one percent of people on the planet that experience those things and 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 are blessed to to be afforded that much gratitude from a single person let alone a whole room um so i I don't know the 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 motivation comes from i would say my motivation is just inherently within my blood yeah and i don't look at it like motivation i look at it like um I i physically love the way singing feels yeah it physically feels amazing. Yeah, I will, <clears throat> I will never know that because this I, is true. I sound terrible, but you know, Matt Goss, the new king of Las Vegas. I'm so proud of you, brother. Thank you for coming, sharing your story, connecting. Always uh, love hanging around you and you know having a few laughs and you know obviously emotionally connecting. It, it's honestly inspiring to hear all that you've gone through, where you are and excited for everything to come. So thank you. And, you and are, you are one of those people. I've said this to you and I want to say it publicly that you, when I met you, it's a, it was a relief because, you know, there's a couple of fellas I've met in this town that just, you know, you need, you need money. You need to have your boys around you as well sometimes. And you are, as we say, where I'm from, you are truly one of the lads and I love you, man. No, thank you again. Thank I you, brother. definitely appreciate it. And congrats on the awards. Thank uh, you, man. Yeah. I love you. I'm proud love of you. you. Too. How do you do? Thanks. And that's a wrap for today's business class. Enjoy today's podcast. Feel free to leave a review on iTunes or share this episode with a friend. Want more hotel boss in your life? Who doesn't? Subscribe to my YouTube channel or follow me on Instagram. Simply look up at the hotel boss. Until next time, hotel boss out.